that's my tokenism to structural materials. Um, now, this is a quote from Daniel Hahnemann. And actually, next week I will probably <laughs> give everyone a copy of this book. Has anyone ever heard of this book, Thinking Fast and Slow? Daniel Hahnemann won the Nobel Prize in economics back in 2002 or 2001 or something. He's a psychiatrist, psychologist, and he's also a statistician. Um, someone recommended this book to me, actually an MIT grad recommended it to me, and it's um, one of the few books I've read that I put a lot of highlights in. One of the, the highlights is I have yet to meet a successful scientist who lacks the ability to exaggerate the importance of what he or she is doing, okay? Materials and new materials, or whatever you read in, in the MIT news and see on the screens at MIT, most of this is oversold, okay? 98% of it is a sales job, okay? And it's not really quite that great. In fact, there's a, uh, a quote that I like and you'll, if you take some of the other modules, you'll probably hear it. So there was a guy at uh, General Electric um, in Cincinnati where they make aircraft engines, <clears throat> and he was head of materials. His name was Robert Sprague. And Robert Sprague had a quote, whenever you first hear about a new material, write it down, uh, because those are the best properties that material will ever have. Okay? And then there's Jim Williams' corollary. Jim Williams was a titanium metallurgist who became department head at Carnegie Mellon and dean at Ohio State, and then he replaced Bob Sprague at General Electric. And Jim Williams says, his corollary to Bob Sprague's quote is, whenever you first hear about the cost of a new material, write it down, because that's the lowest price the material will ever have, okay? So when you hear about, I mean, this is, not only am I unconventional in my teaching, I'm a little bit unconventional in my approach to is material science as wonderful as everybody says? Actually, it is pretty wonderful in many ways, but most people are exaggerating how wonderful it is. Um, has anybody in here not signed up on the class list? Okay, let me just give this back to you. You can sign up, make sure I get it back. I'd, I just like to figure out sometime in the next week how many students I have, okay? Um, so today we're supposed to be starting what is engineering. It's sort of a catch-all. Um, in part because students have asked me to talk about different things at different times, and I finally decided, okay, I'll, I'll put some of these things together, and I could do it in terms of what is engineering. This is the syllabus. It's on the, uh, should be on Stellar. Um, we're gonna start today with definitions of engineering. I'll pass these around, everybody take one. This is your first quiz, at least there's questions on it. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, and then we'll talk about uh, externalities. Do you know what an externality is? It's an economics word. Mm. And it's all the things that don't have to do with what you think the main technical subject is, like politics, uh, uh, eco well, economics, okay, or cost. You know what? Public perception. Public perception, environmental, you know, all these, yes. You know, and we'll talk about that, externalities. Uh, and in fact, externalities are often the biggest hurdle to introducing a new technology. It has nothing to do with technology. Technology is great, but there are other factors. We're going to talk about the history of engineering, um, just because I think you'll be surprised at where engineering came from and where it's various diversions. We're going to talk about the scientific method, and I'm going to talk about Kahneman. That's why I bought you a copy when I found out that Amazon sells these in paperback for $9.19. I figure you're all worth $9.19. If it had been more than 10, maybe not, but anyway. <laughs> uh, in any case, they should be in tomorrow or Monday or whatever, and I'll bring them to class. Kahneman talks about, it's called thinking fast and slow, and thinking fast is your intuitive judgment, and thinking slow is your analytical judgment, okay? And, um, Anyway, we'll talk about that when we get to it. gets into what's an expert, okay? If you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be engineering experts. And what does it mean to be an expert? We're going to talk about design. To a certain extent, engineering is design. Um, and how design has evolved. 
We're going to talk about forensics and how do you get to the root cause of a problem. We're going to talk about errors in logic um, and learning to be honest with yourself and forcing other people to be honest with themselves, which is not always a way to win friends and influence people. But, um, and we're going to talk about language translation and communications, which I said were important, and then we got some miscellaneous topics. But, and if you want some other topic, let me know. I'm happy to try to incorporate it. But right now, I want you to take a couple of minutes to try to answer some of these questions. You, you got the paper. You're going to keep it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to read what you write down. But I want you to tell me what you think engineering is. Go down as far as you can in the next three minutes uh, and try to give me your idea. Okay, I mean, you can keep writing. In fact, what I'd like you to do is keep this. If you want to bring it to class every day, uh, but maybe once a week, you can pull it out and write down any other thoughts you might have, fill in the blanks. At the end of the term, I might give you an assignment to tell me what you finally, how, how your opinions have formed or not formed or changed or whatever. Um, there's a couple other things with this exercise. Uh, I just pulled a teaching technique on you that you should always be aware of. Anybody know what it is? It's called pre-assessment to find out where your students are, okay? Um, you're all at different levels uh, of understanding of what is engineering. And whenever you're teaching someone, the first thing you should do, no matter what the topic is, you know, if, if you're teaching a cooking class, you might want to know if you've got one of the world's top chefs as one of the students. I mean, I remember when... Is that the Gordon Ramsay show? Is that? sneaks in and pretends to be incompetent and sees a teacher's notice. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know that particular example, but uh, Professor Sadaway and I were asked uh, back in the late 1970s to teach a course to 40 IBM students one summer. And we were supposed to teach them introductory material science. And 
fortunately, we did ask them what the, some of the background was. A couple of the students had PhDs in materials. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to be teaching them introductory material science, okay? We also had people who never had a, they were, you know, electrical engineers, didn't know what a material was, okay? So, in fact, we came back and we said, well, how are we going to teach this when we got all the way from people who know nothing to people who have a doctoral degree in the area? Um, but we found out the old MIT technique still works. You go back to the basics, okay? If you go back to the basics, um, people usually can find some insight uh, if you go back to the basics, which are actually simple, okay? Um, so pre-assessment is one thing. The other thing is I sort of sandbagged you. There is no good definition of engineering. Does anybody come up with, an, now that I've said that, and I've, I've now poisoned you, um, or as ha Hahnemann will say, I've, uh, what is he called? I've essentially pre-programmed you to that, you know, I don't believe there's a good, good definition of engineering. Actually, I think there is a good definition. But what happened to me was about 25 years ago, during a Columbus Day holiday, about 24 people from the School of Engineering, department heads and a few others. I think each department head was allowed to pick one younger faculty member. And I was the one that Professor Fleming chose to go down to this retreat on the Cape where we wanted to figure out what the strategy should be for the next 25 years for the School of Engineering. And we spent a lot of time trying to define what is engineering. You would think that 24 engineers from the School of Engineering at MIT could define what engineering is. We spent about a day in little breakout groups, and we finally came up with a, what was, I still think is a very good definition, and I'll give it to you later. But you know what? About 10 years ago, I asked the assistant dean, Donna Savicki, for a copy of it because I didn't have that little report. She, she, she barely even remembered it, OK? So we had this little meeting. This is another lesson. We had this meeting. Everybody spends all this time. I mean, the meeting had to have cost $25,000 for you know, 24 people to go spend a weekend, a three-day weekend at the Cape, right, in a hotel and everything. Uh, probably cost more than that. And we had some output, which actually I thought was valuable, and it gets filed away in a file cabinet and it gets thrown out in the trash someday, okay? So I don't really have the exact definition, but I remember enough of it, okay? So um, anybody have a, something they'd like to submit, or I'll start telling you what some other people said. Yes? So it's like, engineering uh, is the application of logic to generate products, services, or actions that meet some given need. Did you write that down, or did you look that up? No, I wrote it down. Oh, OK, fine. OK, no, that's, that's very good. OK. OK, I just, but you can, you can, you can, you could Google, and I'll show you some Google things that are not all that different than that. But that's very good. Logic and pe personal needs, yes, or people's needs, yes. So it's the application of science to solving real world problems. Yeah, that's good. OK, that, in fact, that's one of the definitions that's, that we're going to go through that other people have come up with. I actually gave all of you something a little while, a few minutes before that. I said engineering is design. Okay. Yep. I said making new things or making things in a new way. Yep. Actually, originally I just wrote making things. Well, it's, that seems it, too bad. Um, it's there's a creative process to engineering that is not involved uh, the same way in science. Okay. So those are all actually pretty good. Okay. So I pre-assess it. You already know more about it than I do, so uh, maybe we're ahead of the game. And we can skip time. But it turns out, um, here's a quote. If it's green, it's biology. If it stinks, it's chemistry. If it doesn't work, it's physics. If it works, but no one knows why, it's engineering. So um, that's the cynical view, which has, you know, cynical is funny. In fact, one of the reasons uh, humor is often funny, particularly things like Dilbert, is because it's true. <laughs> OK? <laughs> Um, there's, or there's a certain truth to it. Let me give you the best definition, succinct definition that I've ever heard, um, and it's from Theodore von Karman. Who was Theodore von Karman? Pardon me? Legendary aerodynamicist. Legendary aerodynamicist. And what laboratory in Pasadena, California, did he find? Jet Propulsion. Jet Propulsion Lab. He found it. He's founder of it in 1940. Is that what you were going to say? Okay, you guys are pretty good. Okay, um, von Karman said, 
The scientist explains that which exists, the engineer creates that which never was. Okay? And he was both a scientist and an engineer. And there's more depth to that definition than you might think. Joel Moses, who used to be dean of engineering here, he was head of electrical engineering and then became dean of engineering, became provost. He used to say, and the media lab cre creates that which never will be. <laughs> okay? So, uh, but a scientist explains that which exists. Um, and there are a lot of wannabe scientists at MIT. Um, most of them are in the School of Engineering, okay? I often say 80% of the faculty in the School of Engineering are wannabe scientists. There's only about 20% engineers on the faculty in the School of Engineering uh, in terms of people who can actually go out and solve a real problem. A scientist will take a, if you present a problem to a scientist, he will throw out all the hard parts so he can solve it in closed form with a fourth order differential equation or whatever sophisticated technique. And in fact, that's what you've learned in many of your classes to do, right? Right, so whereas an engineer, Thomas Edison was an engineer, okay? Thomas Edison sort of was intuitive and he just kind of did things and he made them work and he created things that never were, right? And he didn't understand why, why they worked. And he said it was 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. Whereas a, a scientist would much rather be on the 99% inspiration and 1% perspiration. That's why they do calculations, right? Uh, it's not a lot of heavy lifting to do some. But it takes deep intellect in a very narrow field. Um, Morrison Feshbach, Herman Feshbach was head of physics 20 years ago. And Phil Morse was his mentor, was a faculty member here. They wrote a book called uh, Theoretical Modern Physics or something. It was basically a bunch of mathematical techniques to solve very complex equations, okay? Um, but it's, it's a very famous book, but um, most physicists will throw out the important terms, or not the important terms, difficult terms so that they can solve it ex explicitly, and then they pound their chest and say, see, I solved this problem. Well, they solved a mathematical problem. They didn't necessarily solve a real problem. In fact, does anybody know the story of Brian Josephson and the Josephson effect? Does anybody know what the Josephson effect is? Okay, Brian Josephson was a graduate student about 1962 at, uh, I think Cambridge, might have been Oxford, somewhere in England. And he went to see his thesis advisor. He was, in, I think he was in physics. And, his thesis, and he wanted to know, well, what should I do my thesis on? And um, his professor was busy, so he said, well, well, go solve this problem. It had to do with electrons and things like that. And so Brian Josephson uh, goes out and he writes down the, the differential equation. And most people who had solved this problem in the past, it was sort of a standard problem in physics that the professor had given them, knew that you threw out this one term because it was inconsequential. Brian Josephson, being young, not knowing much about the world, kept, the, kept the, the, the term in, and went through the harder problem of solving it with that term. And he found that he discovered the Josephson effect. The Josephson effect is basically tunneling, tunneling of electrons through insulating layers. And so at age 24 or so, he won the Nobel Prize. I met him when he was about 30, um, and because my thesis advisor, by 1965, with Margaret McVicker, ever heard of Margaret McVicker? Margaret McVicker, the McVicker faculty fellows at MIT. Um, Margaret was a physics student who couldn't get into the physics department at MIT because they won't admit their own. That's why Feynman went to Princeton because MIT wouldn't admit them into the physics department. Uh, Margaret came to the material science department, wanted to do a doctoral thesis, went to Bob Rose and said, what should I do my, my thesis on? He says, go up and see Puffer. Puffer was the technician up in the lab. Puffer trained me in the lab. And Puffer was a genius, should have gotten an MIT PhD, but he grew up in the Depression, and his family couldn't afford to send him to school. But... So P Puffer showed her how to grow a single crystal of niobium, lay down a, an insulating layer on it, put some electrodes on it, stick it in liquid helium, and do tunneling experiments and show you get the Josephson effect, okay? So Brian Josephson, Josephson did the 
the calculation saying, oh, electrons can go through insulating layers. Um, and Bob Rose and Margaret did the experiment. Margaret graduated in like two and a half years, went off as a Cavendish fellow at, or something in, in England, came back here as an assistant professor of physics, and rose to be dean of undergraduate education, but died of brain cancer at about age 41 or 42. Um, but in any case, a scientist explains that which exists, and Brian Josephson made the mistake of solving the harder problem and not throwing out the insignificant term, which turned out not to be insignificant. On the other hand, engineers create things that never were. Um, and they don't always know why they work. Edison, what, how, do you find the, how do you find tungsten as the light bulb? Or actually, he didn't find, that wasn't his first uh, filament. His first useful filament, which for a light bulb, was what? Yeah. It's carbonized horsehair, OK? So he'd just burn up horsehair and turn it into a carbon filament. Had, life like 11 hours or so, if you're lucky. OK, yeah. Um, did the Margaret and Popper get any kind of awards for actually showing that that was true, instead of just doing that? Oh, well, Margaret got a lot of uh, honors when she came back here. Bob Rose gave her a $100,000 DARPA contract um, that he had gotten to help her get started. And she had a bunch of, she created the Europe program. That's what got her tenure. We could talk about Margaret, another story. Margaret was, she actually turned out to be a fantastic administrator as dean of undergraduate education. But the physics department would not tenure her because she could not teach freshman physics. She was incompetent as a teacher. But the MIT teaching award is named after her <laughs> because Paul Gray thought she was great. She was on the board of Exxon when she was 37 years old because Paul Gray was president of MIT, and he thought she was great. And she got tenure at large, not in the physics department, because Paul Gray was president, OK? And Margaret turned out to be a fantastic administrator. The reason we have a biology requirement now at MIT is because Margaret blasted through all the naysayers. And anyway. Uh, but anyway, so Margaret was an interesting individual. But that's not the subject of this course, OK? Um, here's a picture of good old Theodore. If you want to see what he looked like, you can Google him. But there's Theodore von Karman. Um, he was Hungarian, American mathematician, aerospace engineer, and physicist who was active primarily in the fields of aeronautics and astronautics. Okay? Um, so um, now you can go to Webster's Dictionary, which is always the sterile way to do it. Um, but an engineer, noun, is a builder of military engines. That's the number one definition. Why? Well, we're going to find in the history of engineering. Wait, wait. What year was this published? Uh, this, is, uh, this is my Encyclopedia Britannica, so it might be about 1985. But turns out. The first engineering school in the United States was West Point. 17, I'll get the date in here later. Until 1823 or 1824, when they were building the Erie Canal in New York State, and Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute started the, first, uh, the, the second engineering school in the country. And they had one curriculum. It was called civil engineering to distinguish it from the only type of engineering that was known before that, which was military engineering. So now you know where we get the term civil engineering. Okay? But in any case, uh, the word goes back to the 14th century in the French, which means a person who in designs, invents, or contrives. It actually comes from the French word meaning contrive. A designer or a builder of engines. Okay? These could be catapult engines or breastworks and dams and things like that. But an engineer would build military <coughs> facilities. And in fact, the, the commandant of West Point until 1845 was required to come from the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, they changed that, but um, that was part of the history. OK, engineer verb means to act as an engineer in laying out construction or management of something like some great dams or something. Design, design or produced by methods of engineering 
to guide the course of manage or supervise during production and development. What's the interesting word in here that you don't usually associate with engineering? Managing. Management. And I'm going to tell you the history of Harvard's first engineering school. They tried to purchase MIT three times, from <laughs> 1873 to 1917. They were unsuccessful because the Supreme Court of Massachusetts turned it down. So they built on the land that Andrew Carnegie had bought for them in Alston their engineering school. And today it's known as the Harvard Business School. And I'll tell you that story. Huh? Alston. Alston. It's Alston. Yeah, it's across the river. Oh, it's you know, Alston. Alston, Massachusetts, yes. It's, across, it's not in Cambridge, okay. Um, it's across the river. Okay, engineering. The science by which the properties of matters and the sources of energy in nature are made useful to man in structures, machines, and products. You had usefulness to man or something, benefit or something. You had something like that. And you had something similar to um, properties of matter. I don't remember. But your definition, both of your definitions had some of these types of things. So the, <clears throat> that's a... That's a, a common definition. Um, what I'm going to do, I think, because I've never taught this course before, is I have a, a handy dandy little book here called The Builders, Marvels of Engineering. And this book was, it's kind of, okay, was written by none other than National Geographic, okay? National Geographic Society. And here's the, oh, I have the table of contents right here, I guess. Here's the table of contents. And of course, National Geographic, it's a, bunch of, it's a picture book, right? Not too many words, mostly pictures. And it's now owned by Newt Gingrich. Is it? Oh. Just, well, just recently. I've been reading National Geographic since I was eight years old, OK? Uh, I used to have a couple of tons of National Geographic's holding down the floor in my basement. But anyway, finally got rid of them. Um, but they have a bunch of different examples of major engineering marvels. And today, um, since I can't, well, I can't afford to give you this book if it's still in print, uh, but um, it's a nice book. And what I'm going to do probably, I might do every day, is spend a couple of minutes on each one of these things, like today is roads, okay? To give you some examples of major engineering achievements over the centuries. Um, and I'll have Jerry put it, that chapter on roads on Stellar. And the next time I'll do canals, and Jerry can put that on. And by the time the course is over, we will probably have everything on Stellar. I will have violated the copyright laws, but Stellar won't know because the fair use says I can take pieces at a time, right? <laughs> if I just happen to take 100% of the pieces, oh, anyway. Um, anyway, so roads. Let's look at, oops, that's the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Uh, overcoming distance is the, the bit, main chapter. Roads, canals, bridges, railroads, pipelines. This is something you haven't seen before, probably. This is the, uh, the National Road, started in 1811, okay, in Pennsylvania, or Cumberland, Maryland, to Vandalia, Illinois, okay, 600 miles. It's, anyway, you'll, you'll be able to read about this. It's an interesting story about, this is one of the first major projects in 1811 the federal government paid for. It was the first interstate highway, if you will. Okay, if you go on, you'll learn about, this is a Roman road in Syria. Okay, still in use. The Romans built fantastic series of roads all over. They had, was it 50,000 kilometers? Yeah, 50,000 mile network, okay, of roads. And this tells you how they built it. Okay, I'm not going to take the time to go through this. Here's the Incas. This is Incas and this is Incas down here. Well, it's not very clear. It's llamas walking along. This is in Sichuan, China, uh, which is, you know, the, and how the Chinese had 200,000 people working on a road and filled it, uh, completed it in a couple of days. Okay. okay? So the Incas did it without wheels. 
the Incas didn't have a wheel, okay, in their technology toolbox. But they built these huge roads. It goes on, it talks about um, McAdam. Anybody ever heard of McAdam? That's the, the McAdam on the, on, the, on the pavement on the airport. It tells you about John McAdam, who he was. Um, there's the first uh, toll road in 1940 in Pennsylvania. Here's a, um, the Glenwood Canyon. There's actually several pages on the Glenwood. Obviously, the National Geographic had to run a big article on that. Anyway, so it's some <coughs> reading the evaluations. Some students said they wished I could give more reading so you could follow up on things. So I'll give you more reading. Okay, you can read about roads. But going back, the Romans... Their roads are still working after 2,000 years, okay? If you read about how these different people came along and they improved on the Roman system by making it cheaper, faster to build, but doesn't have the same longevity as some of the Roman roads. And those are some of the trade-offs that you have in engineering, okay? You also learn, why did, why did the Romans build these roads? Yeah, and what were they doing? They, it was for their military to be able to get the supplies and the soldiers where they wanted. Anyone ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Okay, what's Maslow's hierarchy of needs? You remember? Yep. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll let you answer. Yep. Yep, so this is a simplified Maslow. This is a more complex. This is just coming right off of Wikipedia or, Wikipedia or whatever. Um, um, basically, the Romans built roads as part of their military security program. Why did we build the interstate highway system in the 1950s? It's called the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. He liked the Autobahn, but there was another military yeah, reason that the generals wanted something. Like yep. They had missiles on trucks. The only way you could keep the Soviets from targeting our launch sites was to move the launch sites. And the Soviets did the same thing. They built mobile launch sites, and we built mobile launch sites. We just built a huge interstate highway system to be able to move the missiles around. Okay. It's harder in the Soviet Union to do that. It's a little larger, okay? But anyway, um, but anyway, the first thing is physiological needs, food, shelter, clothing, okay? The next one is safety, security. That's your military security. The Romans built roads for the second level on Maslow. We built the interstate highway system for the same reason. It was a military endeavor. How many of you think the space shuttle was built for civilian purposes? It was built to hold the lasers they were going to put in space to shoot down the missiles coming at us, okay? It was just the cargo bay just happened to be the exact size of the chemical laser weapon, Amazing. okay? Amazing. <laughs> and, but you couldn't have gotten it through Congress if you were just proposing it as a $20 billion military project. But if you said, we're going to, you know, we're going to make space travel cheaper, so it only cost $1,000 a pound to get into space rather than $20,000 a pound of payload. Now, did they achieve it? The space shuttle over the 25 years or so, they increased the price to about $50,000 a pound in space. They didn't get it down to 1,000. They still talk about trying to get it down to $1,000 a pound, which means... To be fair, in price increase, they made it way safer. The space shuttle is safer? Yeah, it got safer over the course. Well, have you ever heard the story of how uh, Feynman analyzed the, uh, the space shuttle? I mean, the, NASA had been, done this big safety analysis, okay? And they proved by all this probabilistics, they probably paid some professor at some well-known Eastern University um, to help them with this. There was one chance in 10,000 of the space shuttle failing on launch, okay? And then when it failed on launch, um, Feynman was part of the blue ribbon panel that was supposed to figure out what was going on. And they learned it was a 
the O-rings, you know, and the cold weather, and there's whole books written on this stuff. But Feynman basically uh, pointed out that since Werner von Braun had, we stole him from Germany, right? We took all the great scientists out of Germany. Before World War II, the center of science in the world was Germany. It wasn't the United States. I can show you that in, in 1900, you were required at MIT to take several semesters of German so you could read the scientific literature, okay? And all the great science, think of the quantum mechanics folks. Start naming them off, okay? Mostly Germans, right? Um, and people would, Americans would go over to Germany to learn their science and bring it back. After the war, after World War II, the United States became sort of the center of science. Why? Because we picked and choose, we brought them back. There was starvation going on in Europe after the war. Um, and so we brought the people back that we wanted to bring back. And we essentially made the United States great in science by uh, bringing all these other people back. So Werner Braun, since Werner Braun, Braun, von Braun, and they set him up in Huntsville, Alabama, um, they brought him back and um, um, what was, oh, Feynman showed that 4% of the missiles that they had shot since 1947 or whatever uh, had failed on launch. And he also pointed out this was the 25th shuttle flight, 4%. Now that's kind of coincidence, we all know that. Statistic is small numbers. And there's no, it just should have been within the first 25, it shouldn't have been just the 25th. But the media didn't, doesn't understand those types of statistics. So in any case, um, this, the shuttle has not been safer, okay? It's been the same, it has the same. In fact, that's a good example. No, I'm, I'm okay. the course of the shuttle program and not necessarily like, because they do so much more safety and prevention. Oh yeah, but yeah, I mean, not like that's because we've improved safety of aerospace flight generally since 1947, right. okay? That's the just general trend, but there's not some big blip because of that program. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just saying it got more expensive because after, you know, they they started blowing up. Yeah. You know, they're like, oh, well, we better check every part after every mission. Oh, we yeah. We do all this failure analysis, and we need to replace every part all the time. So right. That well, price and, increase. Yeah, and NASA actually learned what Admiral Rickover had found out earlier. Uh, Kahn Kahneman makes, actually makes the point in thinking fast and slow that all the pundits that are predicting politics and, you know, elections and stuff, that he's a statistician, and he, show, he, he uses the term, a blindfolded monkey could do be, with a dart could do better than what these people predict, okay? There's an interesting chapter where he and another guy are kind of at odds. The other guy studied firefighters and basically said, those guys are experts. They make intuitive snap judgments that are right. And Kahneman says, well, most experts make intuitive judgments and you can do better if a blind, blind monkey with a dartboard, okay? Um, and he proves it, okay? So it's, see, that's why he's a nonconformist. That's why I like him. <laughs> anyway, okay, so any questions on this? Yep, oh, you're just stretching. Okay, good enough. It's okay to stretch. Okay, so, um, so that sort of answers part of the second question. We talked about what is engineering. I'm gonna talk some more. Um, what's the difference between science and engineering? Well, von Karman sort of gave us that to a certain extent. But I'm hoping you might refine some of these things. In fact, if one of you wanted to do your presentation on answering some of these questions or how it's evolved, I mean, you could do that. But you'd probably have more interesting things to do. <laughs> how old is engineering as a profession? Anyone have an idea? That's right. <laughs> and how many people say it's very new? It's actually both, okay? Uh, and I'll go through that when we go through the history of engineering. What types of disciplines? We're gonna go through that. What's a PE license and things like that. Uh, PE license is something totally ignored at MIT and almost essential for civil engineers practicing. So this is just what Webster's gave us, sort of, uh, I got it out of some dictionary, not Webster's, but it says the same thing. The, the dictionaries all plagiarize against each other. You ever mm -hmm. notice that? Okay, anyway. Maybe it's because the words have similar meanings. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, to contrive or plan out usually with more or less subtle skill or craft, which means it's sort of an art. It's not 
and some people might say it's not a science, to guide the course of manage or supervise during development. Management is an important part of engineering, and that's going to be one of my themes. Um, engineer is from an old French word, ingenieur, or war machine. All of these words derive from the Latin meaning genius, a divine spirit presiding at birth, or a talent or natural gift. So we now have the etymology of engineer. A war machine or a divine spirit. Okay, anyway. Um, and you can go to engineer's noun, from French to contrive. You have a builder, builder military engineer, engines and military engineer. Uh, contrive, who, someone who designs, invents, or contrives. Could be called a schemer. Okay, that's not exactly a, a polite term for engineer, but someone engineering something, okay? The mafia engineers the internet or something. I don't know. Um, person runs complex uh, machinery, a railroad engineer. Person engaged in occupation requiring special skill, like a sanitary engineer, fix up garbage, right? Uh, person who carries through an enterprise or brings about a result, especially by skillful or artful contrivance. And that's a quote from a number of dictionary definitions. Now, something I've said before, and I said it before to you in this course, is engineering is design. Anybody know what ABET is? Yes, what is ABET? Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology. You will all graduate, if you get an engineering degree from MIT, you will all be ABET accredited. MIT participates in ABET. Uh, and ABET has a design requirement. We, when they come to evaluate us once every four or five years, we have to prove in each department, we have to prove that we have a certain number of units that involve a design component. Because ABET feels engineering is essential to engineer, to uh, or design is essential to engineering. Is that like 3042? Yeah, 3042 is part of that. Um, actually, this course could qualify, but it's not required. Okay. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk about design later. But engineering does design. I mean, we talked about creative or making something new or different or whatever. There's a creati creative aspect of engineering. Remember the, qu the, the stinky quote at the beginning about if it, if it works but no one knows why, it's engineering? Okay. Well, you create it, but you don't Edison didn't know why you know, horsehair worked so well. He later found out tungsten was better, but, um, and then the General Electric spent billions of dollars over the next 100 years perfecting tungsten light bulbs only to have LEDs come along. Um, anyway, engineering is problem solving. One or two of you, I think you said problem solving in your, in your definition. Uh, and that's something that I kind of came up with on my own when I was thinking about this 10 years ago. Um, and engineering is the application of science and math to solve problems. I got that off the internet. If I Google what is engineering, I can go through a bunch of sites, and one of them says engineering is the application of science and math to solve problems. And it is. But now let me tell you what the School of Engineering came up with. I can't tell you what they came up with because they've lost it. Okay, But engineering involves complexity, ambiguity, and uncertainty. Okay, And that's why it's not what a scientist likes. A scientist likes something, they don't mind something that's complex as long as they can write down a mathematical formula for it, okay, to describe it. Okay, But that's what chaos theory is, right? You can write down a formula for, for chaos, um, and you write it down mathematically. But uh, um, ambiguity, I talked to you about you know, your boss doesn't give you everything, just the right amount of information, and no more, no less. Sometimes you don't have all the information, so that's ambiguous. Sometimes you have conflicting information, so that's ambiguous, okay? And uncertainty is, well, if you have conflicting information, you don't know what's right. But it also should involve safety, and I thought of this earlier this week. I came up with this this last weekend. Okay, what are, what's Labor Day for? Being an engineer involves complexity, ambiguity, and uncertainty. That's the school of engineering. Safety is critical. If you read the engineering code of ethics, it will say that safety is paramount. And as a professional engineer, and we'll talk about what that means later, you have a duty 
to hold the safety of the public paramount above your job, above anything else. Okay? So I put safety in there. And I thought about, actually I came up with CAU, and then I came up with safety, and I came up with cause, and I figured I could make it be cause, right? So anyway, um, everything else means, I've always said, if your boss gives you a job to solve, and the solution is to the accounting problem, I don't care if you're a chemical engineer or materials engineer, you gotta solve the accounting problem, okay? Accounting is not always the problem, but I can tell you what 90% of the problem is, or 95% of the problem is, uh, in most cases. Anybody know what the one problem is? Hmm? Yourself, exactly, people. Managing people is the biggest problem in getting anything done. Anyone who's actually been in doing something will tell you that trying to get other people to work together as a team is the hardest job, okay? So what is engineering? This is my summary. Complexity, ambiguity, uncertainty, safety, and everything else. Engineering is everything. Ooh, that's good, I like that. I'll write, make an overhead of that. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll probably be here tomorrow. Dr. Belmar will be lecturing, um, but uh, I don't know who, it'll be he or me on 